Good morning, Hamilton Reformed Church. My name is Kayla Fick. I serve as the ministries coordinator and stated clerk for Zealand Classes. It's been my joy to serve there for the last six years. And as part of that, I've had the opportunity to be in worship with you all at Hamilton over the years, and I've always appreciated the invitation. Thanks to Pastor Adam for inviting me to join you for worship virtually. This morning, I'm coming to you from our home in Zealand, in front of our Christmas tree, and I pray that you all are well this Christmas season. This Sunday marks the first Sunday after the celebration of Christmas. Today, our gospel reading is taken from Luke chapter 2, and we'll begin at verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph took him, that is Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said of the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved with the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, You may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's mother and father marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the hearts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years after their marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting, praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to who they were looking forward to the redemption, spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. As the child grew and became strong, he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This story Jesus presented at the temple by his parents as a baby comes just following what many of us might call a classic telling of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. Mary and Joseph have traveled to Bethlehem. The baby Jesus was born and laid in a manger angels and shepherds appeared with great rejoicing at the birth of Jesus, this promised one, this savior of the world. Peace on earth is sung from the heavens by choirs of angels. But then the world and Luke's narrative continues on. We're very familiar with the Christmas story, but what comes next? Even within this same chapter, Luke 2, what happens next is not always so familiar. What happens now? Peace on earth has been declared as the carol sings a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. But then what? Then what, according to scripture and tradition, is where our story for this morning picks up. Verse 22 of chapter 2. It is now 40 days after Jesus' birth. After eight days, Jesus was circumcised and named according to Jewish law. And now, at 40 days, his parents are again 
performing their duty as faithful Jews. They returned to the temple, this time in order to offer a sacrifice and to consecrate their child to the Lord. All this takes place according to the laws of God for God's people in the books of Leviticus and Exodus. Peace on earth has come. And while Mary's song has declared that the world is turning upside down, life does continue on for the Holy Family. Mary and Joseph come to present Jesus at the temple. They demonstrate their own confidence in God's promises with this action. Their world was turned upside down. Their parents to a brand new baby boy whose life they have already been told so much about. Who this child will be. What this child will do for God's people. And even in the midst of who this great child is, they still follow the law of God according to the custom of the day, as was done for every child. A presentation of this newborn at the temple. Mary and Joseph aren't people of great worldly wealth. They bring a simple sacrifice to turtle doves. But yet, this is no ordinary dedication of this baby at the temple. As they come to the temple, Simeon takes Jesus from Mary and Joseph into his arms. This Simeon is called by scripture as a righteous and devout man. A man to whom God has promised he will see the Messiah before his death. He praises God, saying that he may die now that he has seen salvation. This child, God's light to the world, the glory of all Israel. And if that encounter wasn't enough, next, the temple widow, Anna, gives thanks to God and begins to speak about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. She becomes what some call the first evangelist, sharing about Jesus for all who sought to know how Israel might be redeemed. After completing all of the purification rites, the Holy Family Joseph, Mary, and Jesus continue home to Nazareth. And as the story closes, it says that Jesus grows filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Having pondered this perhaps not as familiar story, taking a closer look at these events that happen just after the birth of Jesus and the declaration of peace on earth, Let's go back to the hymn I mentioned earlier. O oh, holy night, a carol of the night of Jesus' birth. Hear these words of verse one. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. This hymn continues to find its way to me throughout this Advent season, particularly the line, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. It made its way onto the Christmas cards sent out by classes. It made its way onto the Christmas cards sent out by my own family. It keeps coming up. Because as it's no surprise to you, our world is weary this year. Maybe for you too, it has been hard to find rejoicing, to find hope in the midst of circumstance. I seem to find this tune in my head, a thrill of hope the weary world rejoices, sung almost in a pleading way. A way that asks, God, may it be so. May we know a thrill of hope. May our weary world rejoice. And then I think of Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple in our passage this morning. They had their own weariness, probably tired from a journey, 
Mary having given birth to her first child. Their world wasn't as it should be either. Caesar Augustus was ruling over Israel. I think of Simeon, waiting for a promised Messiah, knowing that his life would not end until he had seen this promise fulfilled. I think of Anna and her weariness, living in the temple night and day, night and day for decades, a childless widow, longing for good news to share. But yet there is hope. Into this weary world full of sin and error, our Savior is born. Jesus Christ is here. Into the weary world, this young couple, Mary and Joseph, lives the faith of their mothers and fathers, bringing their firstborn child to the temple. A thrill of hope, Simeon holding the child, holding Jesus, the Messiah, who he has longed to see. A thrill of hope, Anna having good news to share after decades of fasting and praying. And this gives, this hope gives them a reason to rejoice. This hope, for we are a people of hope, gives us a reason to rejoice. We rejoice in the promises of scripture fulfilled at the birth of this child. We rejoice as we read the story, knowing all that Jesus will teach for the death and the resurrection to come, for the redemption of our whole weary world and the making new of all things. In the thrill of hope that was that first Christmas, that holy night, the world was weary then too. Luke records Simeon's song Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, may you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. On closer observation, this is a bit of a strange scene and a strange song. Luke moves from the earlier verses of chapter 2, beauty and light and joy at the nativity, into Simeon responding to the Christ child, asking for death. <laughs> One commentator called this refrain of Simeon's the oddest Christmas carol. It feels out of place, but maybe not this year. Maybe in a different year, talk of death and its light and life of Christmas would feel out of place. But this year has been a different year. We have lived in many ways a year of death and darkness and light and life all mingled together. Simeon's song may feel like one you've wanted to sing too. God, we are ready to be called home to heaven in peace as you have promised, because we know that Jesus has redeemed us. We are tired of this weary world, and we long for your light to be shown to the world. Simeon does speak eloquently of death, eloquently and honestly, because he has confidence. He has confidence in this child that God has sent to redeem all of Israel, to redeem the whole world. As an aside here, if you're looking for further reading that examines life and death in the midst of hope, I suggest you the book The End of the Christian Life. It was written by Dr. Todd Billings, one of my favorite faculty from seminary. As I read the book over the course of this year, it was a gift, a reminder of where our hope truly lies. It's an invitation to embrace life in the midst of morality, to center ourselves in Christ amidst the great catastrophes of our day, even when we feel powerless amidst it all. 
and thinking of this book brings me to a question. Where is it your hope comes from? My hope is in God's great love for us. A love that not even death can destroy. My hope is in a baby sent to earth for the redemption of the world. My hope is in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. If this is where your hope is to experience that thrill, the thrill of the hope of knowing to whom you belong in body in soul, in life and in death, that you belong to God. May that be your thrill of hope in this weary world. But as you name that hope, as you experience its thrill, do not also be afraid to name the weary, to name the ways in which our world is broken, the ways in which you are grieving, the ways in which things are not as they should be. Because as people of faith, we can sing about death and sin and weariness on the same night that Christ is born. We can name death so that it doesn't terrify us or diminish. Because with the coming of Emmanuel, the coming of God with us, we don't need to fear. The birth of Christ, how we live our faith each day, allows us to be strong in our commitment that God is with us forever and ever. And as we claim this hope in God, as we recognize the weary in ourselves and in our world, we move then into rejoicing. We rejoice with the angels and the shepherds, with Mary and Joseph, with Simeon and Anna. We rejoice that we have seen what God has promised. We tell the story with Anna to anyone who will listen for the reason for our hope. We rejoice with Simeon, who rejoiced even if he didn't see the full redemption. We rejoice from the deep tradition of our faith, grounded in God's promises, sent out to live as people redeemed by God. As I close this morning, I want you to want to point you to a few resources, a few things to continue to ponder throughout this week as you wonder what it means to have a thrill of hope, to name your weary, and to rejoice. The first is a, another service that was posted here on YouTube. It's a blue Christmas or a longest night service. It was put together by a fellow Zealand classes congregation, Faith RCA in Zealand. Um, Pastors Marsha and Jonathan and their whole team at Faith did a lovely job putting this service together. If you are feeling weary, if you are longing for hope, if you are looking to rejoice in light of the weariness, I encourage you to check out this service. I will have Adam link it in the comments below or in the description of this video so that it's an easy link for you to find. Um, I invite you to ponder that service as you have space this week, if that would be a gift to you. The other thing I would invite you to do if you either have a hymnal at home or want to look up some of these classic Christmas and Advent carols here on YouTube, they aren't all rejoicing if you look closely. They also sing of the weary, of the hope of what is to come. And so I invite you to page through your hymnal or look up some of your familiar hymns and pay attention to the lyrics. Two in particular, I would start your journey, if you choose to do this, are O Holy Night, look at the rest of the lyrics to this carol. And then the second one is, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. This carol was written in the era of the Civil War in the United States of America. It's a great example of how do we celebrate in the midst of weary? 
How do we respond in the midst of darkness and uncertainty? I will also link that song and the Wikipedia article that talk about what, um, what the history is behind that song. So people of God, as we move from celebration of Jesus' birth, and as we wait for the fullness of peace on earth, be confident. Be confident in the hope that God has come to deliver you. Be assured that in the weary of this world, that we have cause to rejoice in the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God, in your light, guide our path. God, in your love, encourage us in ways to love our neighbors. God, in your grace, carry us when we are weary. God, in your peace, quiet our hearts and minds. God, in your mercy, forgive us and give us life. God, in your abundance, teach us to give to others. Grant us hope that only comes from you. Amen. It was good to be with you this morning. May God's peace dwell with you this season.